This program is brought to you by Emory University. Your Holiness, esteemed members of our afternoon panel and distinguished guests, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our afternoon session of this remarkable day's events. Especially for those of you who are not here for the morning session, I welcome you on behalf of Emory University to this first day of the visit, 2013. My name is Robin Foreman, and I am Dean of the Emory College of Arts and Sciences. This morning, we heard His Holiness the Dalai Lama expound eloquently on the importance of addressing the question of secular ethics in our increasingly complicated and challenging society. As a university committed to liberal education, His Holiness's words resonate deeply with us. The very meaning of liberal education, not liberal as in liberal versus conservative, but liberal as in liberating, represents a commitment to an education that allows students to transcend the boundaries of their individual circumstances to experience the world in all its richness, beauty, and complexity, and prepare them to lead rich, full, successful, rewarding lives, lives of passion and meaning. At Emory, our goal is to prepare leaders who are committed to making a difference in ways that improve the lives of others and who have developed the tools to do so. These tools encompass all areas of personal growth. The intellectual growth is the most obvious element of an Emory education, but the growth of our students' inner values, in the words of His Holiness, is no less real or significant. The Dalai Lama's message is, in part, that the outer world and inner world are not incompatible, and that, in fact, we should be trying harder to bring them closer together so that they may inform and enrich each other. The title for this afternoon's session is Secular Ethics in Education. We're fortunate to have such distinguished speakers, scientists, and researchers with us for this discussion. We are reaching a critical and exciting juncture when the insights from the sciences are increasingly relevant to questions about the inner world of human nature. In recent years, science, much of it carried out at Emory with the encouragement and support of His Holiness, is providing new understanding of and insights into basic human values like compassion, empathy, forgiveness, and gratitude, and the positive effects they have on our health, our behavior, and our communities. The topic of secular ethics in education is central to the question of how we provide a student experience that develops the whole person and all aspects of what it means to be a successful, healthy adult and a citizen of the world. And we're grateful to His Holiness the Dalai Lama for encouraging and participating in this important conversation. For their part in making all this possible, I would like to extend my thanks to the Mind and Life Institute, who will serve as co-presenters this afternoon. Serving as moderator for this afternoon's panel is Mind and Life President Dr. Arthur Zients. A leader in the emerging field of contemplative pedagogy, Dr. Zients was professor of physics at Amherst College from 1978 to 2012. He's the author of the books Catching the Light and Meditation as Contemplative Inquiry. He's co-author of The Quantum Challenge and The Dalai Lama at MIT and co-editor of Goethe's Way of Science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zients and the other distinguished members who will join His Holiness the Dalai Lama for our afternoon panel. Thank you. Yes, my name is Arthur Zients. I'm president of the Mind and Life Institute. And it's a wonderful privilege and pleasure to be here once again with Your Holiness on this stage and with our distinguished guests from both the Emory University campus here and from the Mind and Life Institute. We're going to be working today to bring in some sense to life what it was that was being spoken of by His Holiness this morning. He spoke forcefully and passionately, one could say, and quite personally about the role and origins of compassion as a guiding principle that shapes our ethical lives. Today we're going to be receiving and hearing from two scientists concerning their work in the sciences in a way that supports and gives a foundation in science for this work in secular ethics. And then we'll have two presentations 
concerning the ways in which compassion training and the development of secular ethics can actually be implemented in schools and other venues where young people mature and take on the form that they will then lead, or lead later in life. So we'll have two presentations on the sciences, two from the field of education. There'll be a little bit of musical chairs up here in the front as people move around as they're presenting. Not to worry, that's all part of the plan. There'll also be a short discussion period after the two scientists make their presentations. And then there'll be a longer general discussion period at the end. I'd just like to lift out a couple of themes that were brought up this morning by His Holiness. One was the role of awareness and dialogue in place of force. How is it one cultivates awareness? How is it one actually enters into and engages the dialogue, which is a true listening and speaking, not a superficial exchange, but a deep dyadic form of awareness and attentiveness? He spoke especially about a better future. I'm very much on the side of the 20th century, but many of you who are younger, who are here, are part of that 21st century. How is it that we learn to shape ourselves, to cultivate those innate capacities within us, so that that 21st century, which we've just entered, can be far better, far less violent, in the 20th century, which we've just left behind. I'd like to uh, first ask whether His Holiness would like to make some opening remarks before we begin this session. If you would like to make some opening remarks, now would be a great time to do so, Your Holiness. Okay. <coughs> Usually, when we also they having discussion with the scientist. Uh, I have to tell him. Uh, firstly, as is of academic level, uh, modern science uh, I think through research, through experiment, and with help of tremendous sort of powerful instrument, uh, our knowledge, uh, outer world, and galaxies, and the whole of the universe, all day. Mm -hmm. Cosmos. The cosmos. Uh, I think year by year increasing. Wonderful. Uh, however, about our inner world, mind, or different kind of so the emotions, emotions. Uh, I think modern science, uh, I think not covered. Because I think up to now, it's a science mainly the thing which can observe by, uh, by, uh, by third person, go like that, and also is a can measurement. So subject as a mind or consciousness or emotion, these are uh, no form, formless, only experience. And also the consciousness at uh, some level even not much sort of, sort of notice. Okay. Uh, so there are sort of more subtle way of variety. Uh, this, uh, up to now, I think till uh, later part of 20th century and late 20th century, uh, not much pay attention. Uh, I think something like, I think matter and mind the science mainly is developed in the field of matter, not mind. Uh, so mind also reality. Not only reality, but daily life, 
very much sort of relevant, very much sort of an important, important factor. So knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge, I think must include about mind, about emotion, just academic level. Then, uh, we, everybody, seven billion human beings, including scientists themselves also, <laughs> you see, want peace of mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I love you see, teasing other people. <laughs> so you see, those scientists uh, who carry sort of serious research work in big laboratory, but full of anger, I think their research may not be very successful. <laughs> <laughs> or too much attachment. <laughs> so. The scientists themselves also, you see, uh, daily experience this inner sort life. Of no. Inner life. Mm. Uh, so uh, it seems, you see, up to now, the scientists really selfless, you see, looking outward, uh, outside, and not looking themselves. <laughs> So now, problem, particularly, as I mentioned before this morning, man-made problem, not created by physical, but create mind. Uh, too much desire, uh, too much attachment, and attachment develop anger, hatred, and that brings violence and cheating, uh, bully, all these negative things, negative human activities. You see, uh, uh, not because of, of accidentally, okay. but uh, with certain motivation. So, the real troublemaker is within ourselves. For example, you see the in this country, a lot of talk, gun control. Uh, actually, uh, who creates sort of uh, trouble from uh, the barrel of gun? Not by itself, but by a human being. So ultimately, real gun control must take care, not outside for the weapon. So, so I think uh, uh, gun control, external gun, is sometimes very useful. <laughs> uh, when I visit some Oh, what's the day? Because of the uh, sanctuary survey. Animal. Uh, not it. Um, the uh, game. Uh, animal sanctuary. Oh, yeah. sanctuary. <coughs> and in India, also, you see, in, in, the, in, the, in the early period, I love, you see, visit this area. Wildlife. Uh, wildlife. wildlife so some tigers. Mm. And some sort of, what's the buffalo. Uh, and some elephant like that. Uh, so when we start to visit uh, some sort of uh, police, they ready <laughs> to shoot if something happened. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's a gun. Uh, of course, you see the good purpose. A gun also is useful. However, you see. Uh, The real troublemaker is our inner negative emotion. That always will bring disaster. Firstly, person himself or herself also firstly, immediately destroy peace of mind. Completely destroy sort of mental relaxation. Anger come. Fear come. Uh, 
immediately the inner peaceful moment immediately destroyed. And constantly that experience of physical well-being also destroyed. So real troublemaker is not outside, but here. So, so that thing, we simply pay not much attention. Just take for granted. granted love. I think that's mistake. If we are animal, like also rather, uh, I'm ordinary animal, animal no. then uh, cannot do much. Attachment, anger, this also part of biological factor for different oneself. Anger come. Collect some because of the tunji. Uh, conditions for survival. Oh, desire, attachment. This brings that. So, uh, according to these emotion, biological reaction also come together. Uh, but then we human being, this intelligence. So, can sort of deal with this uh, emotion, which actually biological factor. Some positive thing use or with help of human intelligence can further develop, they, develop. Uh, develop. Uh, and destructive emotion with uh, awareness, uh, help of awareness can decrease, uh, decrease uh, that. So uh, that's if you sort of experiment your daily life. Uh, you will understand our intelligence can make different shape of our emotion. So now that, I think it's really worthwhile to explore more that field. So now that is now uh, not only just academic level, but also you see the, because we're in order to uh, Transform, no. uh, transform, or in order to achieve happier, relaxed mind. Uh, so sh we should need, should have more knowledge, more because of the interest or concern about this inner world. So two things. So I feel very, very happy, and in fact grateful, number of scientists. Now over uh, 20, 30 years, see, they really uh, made cause a tremendous sort of contribution. contribution and raised interest from many sort of people. So, so I would like to take this opportunity, deep thank, deep appreciation, for the and the Ritchie and other scientists. They really made tremendous contribution. Uh, so, I really feel something like Azubir Lutiburuchi. Like all his colleagues. Uh, genuine. Not for money, not for name, uh, just through their own profession, how to make contribution, better world, better human being, happier human being. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you much. But still, uh, I want I, I want to add something. Still, this is just beginning. Uh, so. Uh, my friend, scientist, uh, please carry still more active sort of experiment or research work in it. Uh, well, other, uh, like me, very shining hat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think more shine than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, myself, 
now uh, 78 year old. Uh, but this work uh, we simply start, I think, the rest of our life we should dedicate in this work and meantime hand it over or raise interest from younger generation so that like science development generation to generation carry research work experiment then more and more concrete result come so that i want to tell, to share with you thank you So all you uh, young scientists out there, you have been warmly invited into this great project. We look forward to working with you, all of us, in the decades ahead. Your Holiness, I'd like to begin then, if we might, with the first of the two scientific presentations. We begin with Franz de Waals, who is a member of Emory University's psychology department and the C.H. Candler Professor of Primate Behavior. Franz is the author of a huge number of research papers, a number of books, including most recently his book, The Bonobo and the Atheist, In Search of Humanism Among the Primates. So we'll have a, about a 10 minute or so presentation from Franz, and then we'll move to Richie. Franz? I'm very pleased, and very, does this work actually? Yes. Yeah. I'm very pleased and very honored to be in your presence again. Uh, last time we spoke, I spoke about empathy in animals, and, and now I'm, I want to do something else, actually. It's, it's interesting, what I find particularly interesting is that there's an enormous kinship between my position on morality and the position that His Holiness explains in his book, Beyond Religion, because basically he explains that morality is not the domain of one particular religion. Religion may be helpful, no one excludes that religion may be helpful for morality, but it is not necessarily the source of morality. And um, I have, by a completely different direction, uh, reached the same conclusion. Now, I'm a primatologist, I, I work at the Yerkes Primate Center, I actually work in Lawrenceville, which is very near here, Essential. where we have uh, a lot of primates, and I work on chimpanzees and bonobos and capuchin monkeys and that sort of primates. And in my book, The Bonobo and Atheist, actually the question comes up, the, the, can an atheist be moral? And the bonobo answers the questions. The bonobo answers that, yes, of course, uh, an atheist can be moral because morality comes from within and it's not necessarily something that you need to be a believer for. Uh, again, not excluding that religion plays a role, but religion is, again, not the source. of. And so I reached the same sort of conclusion based on my observations of primates and, and my experiments with primates, um, I usually try to phrase it in terms of building blocks of morality. I would never claim that a chimpanzee or a bonobo is a moral being the same way that we are moral beings. Um, so, some people try to push me in that direction, but I'm not ready to claim that. Um, but I do feel that primates have what I call the building blocks of morality, like, like empathy, and compassion is related to that, obviously. Uh, forgiveness. We do a lot of studies on reconciliation, which is related. We cannot know about forgiveness in primates, because that's an inner process. But you can study the outward process, which is reconciliation, which is that two, two chimpanzees who have had a big fight. Uh, afterwards, they come together and they kiss and embrace. And that's a reconciliation. And, and I think in order to achieve that kind of process, you do need to have some sort of inner switch which comes close to forgiveness where you turn off the hostility and turn to friendship and, and friendly behavior. Uh, we look at other things like the sense of fairness. Uh, do primates follow rules? Um, the sort of studies that we do. I've brought two videos of my experiments. One, one typical study that we do is we set up a, an experiment where, where one chimpanzee can produce food for himself, but he can also produce food for a partner. And, and we see, do they only think about themselves or do they also think about the partner? And if you do that kind of experiment, you find that chimpanzees actually have an interest in providing food to a partner and, and are 
probably it's, like in humans, it's probably a self-rewarding process for them to do that. And so spontaneously, they also help each other. A typical example is we have an old female in, in the group of chimpanzees who can barely walk anymore. And so she cannot join the others in the, in the climbing frame where they usually sit and groom each other. And, and we've seen young females walk up behind her and push her up in the frame and, and get her in the right position, a thing that she could never do on her own. And so we study that kind of processes of empathy. And, and let me show you the first little video, which is um, on bonobos. Bonobos are closely related to chimps, but I think they're more empathic than chimps. Can I have the first video? And she's now giving it to Malaika. And what you see here is a bonobo feeding a bottle to another bonobo. This is not something we have taught them at all. This is spontaneous. In order to do this, you have to take the perspective of another to some degree. I don't know. It looks very simple to us, but I don't know any other animal who does this kind of stuff. But bonobos do it. So she tips back the bottle. She brings it back up when, when the mouth is full. Now she feeds some more. And bonobos play this kind of games all the time. And so this is actually not that serious a situation. But we also look at how they respond to the distress of others, for example. So when one of them is screaming after a fight, what do they do? Uh, actually, they console each other. They, they walk up to the, the, that individual and put an arm around it and calm them down, which is very similar to human empathic behavior. And it's actually the way a lot of human empathy is being tested by asking some, someone in the family to cry and then see how young children react to that. And so we see, see the same sort of reactions in the bonobos. And so we feel that empathy is very highly developed in all the mammals. I also work with elephants a little bit. And, and of course, there's lots of dog studies now coming on. And, and so empathy is a mammalian characteristic. It's not limited to us or to the primates. Uh, and, so, and so there's an increasing amount of research on that particular issue. Now, I, I call it the building block of morality, but morality is, of course, much bigger than it. empathy is, I think, essential. Without empathy, you could not get morality, but uh, empathy is not sufficient. And so we also do studies on fairness, and, and so you may wonder how we can study fairness in primates. Um, we started doing this with capuchin monkeys, and at the moment we do a lot of experiments on chimpanzees also. Uh, chimpanzees in the field, they share meat. So that's where the fairness comes in. They, they capture monkeys, they eat them, and they share the meat with each other. And there's an enormous amount of protest if the meat is not well divided. And um, we do experiments on that particular situation. And we started doing that with capuchin monkeys. The typical experiment, let me describe the experiment before I show the video. A typical experiment with the capuchin monkeys is that we put two monkeys who know each other, we put them side by side. We have them do a very simple task, which is that they need to, we throw a rock in their cage, they need to put it in our hands back. Once they do that, they get a reward. Now, one of them gets a very good reward, which is grapes. The other one gets a lousy reward, which is a piece of cucumber. Well, cucumber is normally fine. Cucumber is a perfectly fine food for capuchin monkeys to do a lot of work for. Her. Um, but if the other one gets grape, um, they're very unhappy about that. <laughs> and, and, and so I'm going to show you the little experiment that we did. Can I have the second video? So here the monkey gives us a rock and gets a piece of cucumber. And the first piece is still good. He's, she's eating the first piece. The second needs to give us a rock and gets a grape. The first one looks at that. He's going to give us a rock again, gets again cucumber. <laughs> and the sec he gets again uh, you will again get cucumber for this. <laughs> so, so, in this experiment, 
when we did this, uh, there were some philosophers who were very unhappy when we spoke of fairness because they had, of course, written big books about justice and fairness, and monkeys never occurred in those books. Uh, and they, they had no room for this. And, and one of them even said it's impossible that monkeys have a sense of fairness because fairness was discovered during the French Revolution. <laughs> uh, but it shows a little bit how narrow they are thinking about these issues. This is a very emotional reaction. And, and the last thing I want to say about this sense of fairness is that in chimpanzees, it, it goes even further than this. In, in chimpanzees, we have seen situations where the, the chimp who gets the grape refuses the grape till the other one also gets the grape. And so the chimpanzee sense of fairness, we've tested it with the famous ultimatum game, is actually quite similar to the human one, I would say. Um, uh, and if you ask me now what the differences are between the human and the chimpanzee sense of fairness, I really don't know anymore if there are differences. And so th these are what I call the building blocks of morality. And since they are much older than even our species, let alone much older than our current religions, uh, I completely agree that morality is something for which religion is not strictly necessary, even though I don't exclude the possibility that religion is helpful. And, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franz. Did you want to ask a follow-on question? Yes, one more question. The, you use atheism. Yeah, the more open the atheist law. It, atheist. Atheist. Law. atheist. Uh, many years ago, uh, so when I sort of used the word atheism, uh, in the sense, no concept of creator. Uh, then Buddhism also a kind of atheism. So then some my friend, you see, told me atheist, atheism means anti-God. Uh, later I also see asked some Christian, uh, what's it there, the teachers. Not uh, Spiritual teachers. Not uh, no clear answer, no clear sort of explanation. Uh, however, now, the point is, if, so that person used to told me, like Buddhism, uh, no concept of creator, but not anti-God. Uh, so if, you see, we mix sort of the non-believer as the atheist, then I think the uh, non-believer uh, not necessarily anti-God. Mm -hmm. Simply, no conviction about that. So this, I think, we, I think we should make sort of that no, yeah. sort of distinction. distinction yeah. So we Buddhist, uh, then that person is, uh, actually is told me, Buddhist, no concept of creator, but not anti-God. So if the non-believer Truly, you said the, so the, so the, I mean, uh, the di kung tani. No, the atheist kung tani. The atheist say, "Ko the yang ni zhu ko jin da kar wan long." His Holiness is making the point that, uh, you know, once someone mentioned to His Holiness that the word atheism connotes some kind of anti-religious stance, not just non-acceptance of the, uh, you know. That that person actually you see meant the uh, explain. The Latin word. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. So later I discuss. I asked some Christian, uh, what's it, teachers, some missionary uh, school. I didn't get to the clear sort of yeah, explanation. It, it is, uh, I think it's different by culture. So in the, in the U.S. there is now a, a strong atheist, new atheist movement which is very anti-religious and anti-God and doubts God and all of this. Uh, I'm personally, I'm from the Netherlands, which, which has 
which is not mostly secular now, and I think 60% of the people say they're non-believers. Yes, secular, okay. Yeah. Secular, yeah. okay. But uh, the, the, the Dutch are very humanist in many ways, yeah. and they're not anti-religious. And, and I per personally, I cannot see myself being against God or against yes, religion. Yes, in, in, in addition, if you want to be against God, you need to believe in God, so, so you cannot be an atheist. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジェイズ。ジ
And uh, what we can see in this video is uh, this little cartoon. And uh, that's one of the videos. Now, a second video that was shown to six-month-old infants is this video. Now, it turns out that six-month-old babies prefer the first one. They look more at the first one than at the second one. We can use uh, very simple behavioral methods to infer preference. And infants prefer the helper compared to the hinderer. Now, something very similar is shown in the next video. Okay, and now the next video is similar but importantly different. <laughs> now, if you ask eight-month-old infants, which of these two elephants they prefer, these little puppets, they prefer very strongly the elephant that helped compared to the elephant that hindered. Very strong preference at eight months of age, so before they're one year of age. So it, this clearly shows that these preferences for generosity are present very, very early in life. Now, may I ask please. a question? You see, you tested uh, uh, more children, same age, or just one case? Many, many cases, oh. many, many children. Yes, very good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And so, not every single infant shows this, but most show this. Yes. So, this is a study which was published uh, recently that simply shows that if you ask children how happy they are if they receive a treat, versus giving a treat that they really like to somebody else, um, it turns out that they are the happiest when they give something they really care about when they give it away to another. That produces the strongest levels of happiness compared to playing with a toy they prefer or other activities, receiving a treat. If they can give the treat away, they actually are happiest compared to all of the other conditions that are tested. Uh, and so this uh, is a finding which I think is consistent with something that you've been sharing with us for years, Your Holiness, that the, um, one of the most effective ways to promote happiness and well-being is to be generous to others. And this is with also very young children. So the third point um, is whether virtuous qualities of mind, like compassion and generosity, may be biologically advantageous. Uh, biologically advantageous in the sense that they promote healthy changes in the brain and in the body, which may be important for both physical health and also for mental well-being. Uh, and so there are many examples of this now. Uh, one is the impact of mindfulness and compassion meditation on the immune system and also on inflammation 
and Brooke actually has done some important work, which I'm sure she'll talk about uh, in this area. Uh, and there's now increasing scientific evidence to show that equanimity and compassion both uh, are associated with beneficial changes in these immune and inflammatory processes. Uh, we also find that the generation of compassion through simple meditation practices can promote changes in the brain that are associated with resilience. Being able to, uh, uh, to let go of destructive emotions quickly uh, and not, not uh, carry them, uh, not hold grudges, not show negative emotion which persists in situations where it's not very useful. And so I'll just give two simple examples of this. Um, this is from a study that was published now many years ago. Uh, it was one of the first studies to show this, that people who never meditated before and who practiced simple mindfulness meditation, which promoted more equanimity and reduced their anxiety after just eight weeks, show a boost in their immune response to a flu vaccine, where they actually show a stronger response. It's the participants who are in red are the ones who are randomly assigned to the meditation condition, and uh, they show a larger increase in the uh, antibody titers in response to the vaccine, which means that the vaccine is working more effectively. And um, uh, in very recent work, we have looked in the brain, and this is an example of a hypothetical example of one person who uh, responds to a stressful challenge and a second person who responds to the same challenge, but that second person returns back to baseline more quickly. And in, in that way, they're carrying around the negative emotion less. They are showing a pattern that we would consider to be resilient. And we can measure this directly in the brain using modern imaging techniques, looking at brain circuits that we know to be involved in destructive emotion. And uh, on the slide here is uh, an example of individuals who are practicing either mindfulness meditation or compassion meditation for, for eight hours in our laboratory. These are individuals who are all living in the West and who have a minimum of a 10-year meditation practice daily. And after eight hours of compassion practice, in red are the long-term meditators and in blue are novices. And what this is representing is signals in the amygdala of the brain. It's an area that Your Holiness has heard about before, an area that is very important uh, in responding to threats and uh, very uh, involved in stress and anxiety, among other things. And what we see is that after eight hours of compassion practice, the meditators, are, after the um, eight hours of compassion, the meditators are showing a reduced response uh, in this area of the brain to, uh, to pictures that depict uh, human suffering and that elicit um, uh, certain kinds of negative emotions. So um, uh, these findings simply show three things. Again, to just summarize, they show that infants prefer generosity. They show that when uh, infants are generous to others, it promotes their own happiness. And it shows that meditation practices which promote uh, equanimity, compassion, and other virtuous qualities actually lead to changes in the brain and the body which appear helpful for our mental and our physical health. So, thank you, Your Holiness. I'm going to take just a few minutes for uh, a discussion. And maybe I can pose the first question. But I think many of us uh, have been told a very different story about the nature of the human being, the nature of the bonobos and animal world, namely the survival of the fittest. 
as the story of evolution, that nature is bloody and tooth and fang, and we're sorry about this, but you just have to get used to this mode of understanding. Whereas what we're hearing from Franz is that the building blocks of morality, empathy, and so forth are part of the bonobo's vocabulary, if you will, behavioral vocabulary. Richie pointing out that infant studies point to innate generosity and so forth. How is it we think or reconcile these quite different pictures of our moral origins? Well, I'd be happy to take a, a stab at that and then uh, I'd be interested to hear Franz as well. Um, in many ways, I think of qualities like compassion as very similar to language. We all come into the world with an innate capacity for language. But in order for language to, to emerge, it requires that we be embedded within a linguistic community, a community of language speakers. Uh, we need that input, that environmental input for this seed, which is the capacity for language to actually become expressed. And I think compassion is very similar. Uh, we are all born, I think, with an innate capacity to express compassion. But I think we need to nurture those seeds by being in the presence of compassionate others in order for that seed to actually flower. Uh, and the, the evidence of the sort that I showed clearly indicates that if given a preference, very young infants uh, prefer a generous or a compassionate other compared to an individual who is, um, uh, who is destructive or unhelpful. Uh, and so it doesn't mean that those characteristics can't be trained if we're in a, uh, a, a toxic or negative environment, but it suggests that there is an innate preference in the start. Um, however, that preference, in order to be expressed, requires the right kind of support in the environment. Which points in turn to the secular ethics or from early childhood to young adulthood and through life as a kind of educational objective. Franz, do you want to add anything? Yes, yeah, so these findings, does this work? Yeah. <clears throat> these findings on young infants, of course, also indicate that already before a lot of education has taken place and a lot of thinking and, and reasoning takes place, there are these preferences for certain outcomes, uh, which already hints at, at some biological background to it. And I think what has happened in the last century or centuries is a is a mixing of our view of, of nature with some ideology that states that competition is good and competition is fine and we should all hit each other over the head and that, and that will be fine because that's how nature operates. Now, if, if you want to look for competition and aggression, you will fi find plenty of it in nature. I mean, it's really not absent. There's an enormous amount of competition going on. But what has been forgotten in that whole scheme is that many animals, including humans, but also, let's say, elephants, dolphins, primates, they live in groups. And they live in groups for a reason. They live in groups because they cannot survive alone. And actually, a primate who lives alone does very poorly in terms of um, survival. Wait a second. Yeah. And, and so, since they live in groups, they need to compromise. If you live in groups, you need to get along. You need to reconcile after fights. You have your cooperation partners. You cannot kill them, because if you kill them, you lose your cooperation partners. And so um, if you depend on group life, it constrains very much what you can do. And you need to start caring about others. And, uh, and I think uh, empathy, is for, m for mammals at least, is one mechanism that, uh, that we do that. And so I think biology has gotten mixed up with some very bad ideology which has resulted in the fact that we very one-sidedly emphasized the competition part and neglected the cooperation and empathy part of animal nature, uh, because it's clearly there if you look for it. Great, thank you. Uh, if I can ask a question of, of Your Holiness. Your Holiness, you often talk about the importance of reasoning and intelligence in the cultivation of these values. One of the things that um, has been uh, a, a finding that's come up over and over again in the behavioral sciences as well as in neuroscience 
is that people often will engage in certain actions even if they fully understand that that's not in their best interest. Uh, so their reasoning teaches them that the actions in which they're engaging may not be very helpful, uh, but they, they, they just do it anyway. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you can, um, uh, and, and we know also that there are different brain systems that mediate that. So uh, uh, there is certain kinds, of, there are patients with very select damage to the brain uh, where uh, they will uh, fully understand the reason for doing something uh, and can, can, can describe it to you, yet they can't actually do it. Um, because the systems that are involved in knowledge and the systems that are involved in action uh, are not talking to each other. Uh, and so uh, I wonder if you can uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on how you understand the, the role of reasoning uh, in producing these changes that may be helpful. <laughs> I think this morning I mentioned uh, uh, some sort of believer. Of course, they know this is cheating other people and also the pretension. Right? pretension. You see, they know it's not good. Uh, and according to our religion, also you see, consider these are negative. So, uh, so therefore, there is a phrase in Tibetan which means to do something knowingly, almost out of out of defiance. Mm -hmm. So intelligence, simply, you see, they telling us what's right, what's wrong. Now they. Uh, impl implementation, it. is it good and bad? Is your conviction, your willpower? Willpower very much related with conviction. So intelligence give us or open, open us it. The, the thing. Then whether we implement or not, whether it's the full conviction, this wrong action is ultimately not only harmful other, but also harmful myself. myself. Oh. So that's why the, the, educa the secular education supposed to see, firstly, bring awareness. Then through awareness, you see, bring conviction. Mm -hmm. Then, you see, the, uh, every sort of activities uh, carry truthful, or openly, uh, rather truthfully. Uh, no. So that, uh, and then, you see, you can carry these activities transparently. That brings trust. That brings friendship. That brings happy society. So, so ultimately, as I mentioned earlier, you see the wise selfish, you see the thinking, uh, the conviction, how, how to bring conviction. Oh, God stayed that for me, Buddha stayed that. That's Shail Demro. Because it's, you're making the reason dependent upon something outside mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. But through my own sort of understanding, analyze. Right. Uh, if such such act, uh, activities I carry, if I can in, indulge in right? them, but then it's harmful. Finally, I myself become a loser. So that brings conviction. So there needs to be something more intrinsic to the motivation why would you would act in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mere knowledge will not sort of bring yeah. full conviction. So that's why you already use the word meditation. Meditation means familiarize. Yes, yes. Uh, through familiarization, 
you see, you get more sort of that conviction. Mm -hmm. Some sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Holiness. Thank you very much, Richie. You know, now Thank we're you. going to uh, turn to the next two presentations. We'll ask Geshe Lopsang to uh, take the seat, the hot seat there. You know, the, uh, this is traditionally called the hot seat. You can imagine why. Uh, it's only this just mentioned contemplative practice or meditation, this, uh, this <coughs> rehearsal, the familiarization. And uh, what we're going to hear about now are two efforts, one at Emory, one at Mind and Life. Although Brooke started at Emory, now is at Mind and Life. Uh, to implement what it is we've been working with in the sciences, what it is that we've been talking to you about over many years, now to actually bring to application that which had been part of our dialogues between you, Buddhist philosophical friends, and scientists. So I'd like to welcome, first of all, Geshe Lopsan Megi, who is, of course, from Emory University. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Religion. He's also the director of the Emory Tibet Partnership and co-director of the Emory Tibet Science Initiative and co-director of the Emory Collaborative for Contemplative Studies. So please, Geshe. Your Holiness, in making presentation on compassion as the foundation for secular ethics, I'm deeply and acutely aware that there is nothing that I can present to you as Your Holiness represents or embodies the very compassion and the ethics that it, it promotes. Uh, therefore, this presentation that I'm making is just a humble offering to you and to see if I'm on the right track. In 1998, Your Holiness, when you visited Emory University to deliver the commencement speech to the graduating students of Emory University, your advice was that, I believe that education is like an instrument. We have education on the one hand. On the other hand, we have a good person. A good person means someone with a good heart, a sense of caring for the welfare of others. Education and the warm heart, a compassionate heart, if you combine these two, then your education, your knowledge will be constructive. And uh, um, a year or two after Your Holiness wrote this monumental text, uh, The Ethics for the New Millennium, in which Your Holiness articulated the very foundations for, for ethics, secular ethics, and uh, how to cultivate such. In, in um, the book, Your Holiness, you called for a revolution, a spiritual revolution, not of economic or political or even, even technological revolution. And this spiritual revolution, Your Holiness defined as, uh, it is a call for a radical reorientation away from our habitual preoccupation with self. It is a call to turn toward the wider community of beings with whom we are connected, and for a conduct which recognizes others' interests alongside our own. And just as Franz Duval earlier mentioned, that as social animals, as social beings, this sociality is so important. Uh, Charles Darwin, the father of him, the, the, the evolution, he himself saw as the sympathy and the sociality as one of the strongest instincts for us as social animals. Now, what I like to see is that uh, can we teach <coughs> compassion? If the compassion provides such a basis for us to act uh, ethically and to have developed this moral uh, life, and at Emory University, based on the writings that Your Holiness has pre uh, presented, as well as this ancient tradition of Lojong, uh, which we try to make it as secular, so that therefore that it can be applicable universally. Uh, developed a protocol in uh, 2003, 2004, primarily to uh, test if compassion training can actually help our students. And we did the first one with the undergraduate students, freshman students. In the, the protocol, what we tried was that to see what are the essential tools that we need. And the, one of them, obviously, is 
the emotion regulation. And the first three steps basically have to do with how we can regulate emotion, recognize emotion, have greater awareness, but also that flexibility to have the create a gap between the impulse and the reaction. And that, as in the Lojong tradition of the training in the shamatha, uh, as well as the vipassana, uh, something referred to as self-compassion, otherwise uh, uh, to, to do with recognizing the actual causes of <coughs> suffering. As your holiness mentioned earlier, that the, the desire, the extreme desire, is one of the, the, the uh, major causes of our inability to act uh, appropriately. And of course, when it comes to as social beings, as the social instinct or our, uh, the social connectedness seems to be so important, which is your holiness have, has recognized that the, in, uh, in articulating the uh, sacred ethics in beyond religion, the two principles your holiness brings, the two key principles, you said that only those two principles are the key, and that is one of them is shared humanity, the other one being interconnectedness. The first one, the developing impartiality in the compassion training, as your holiness are aware, uh, that um, to broaden our, this biological given, biologically given ability to connect with others, empathize with others, uh, there are strategies, there are ways to uh, develop, and uh, of course, for the compassion, and that leads to ethics. Most important thing in the Lojong training seems to be uh, endearment or the affectionate love, known as Yongi Champa. And uh, so, in training this, um, of course, with the graduate, uh, undergraduate students, we found that uh, the eight weeks of training certainly helped them respond to stresses much differently biologically, with less, less inflammation, less cortisol, and so forth. But these um, are two slides that I'd like to uh, share with Your Holiness have to do with uh, the studies that the Brook has been involved, uh, another colleague that you just met, um, uh, Brandon, and many colleagues here, actually, the Aaron uh, Robbins is in the audience is here, that who has done, and the Jenny Mascara, this one refers to one of our colleagues, who, um, in the Compassion at Emory, we have this study called the CALM study, where uh, we study one group, Compassion, another group, just attention part, and a third one uh, is the control group. And here, to see, can we teach uh, students to get better in empathy? Uh, and this uh, part, it shows in two ways. One, looking at the brain known as inferior frontal gyrus. It's apparently, this seems to be a part of the brain that's very rich with mirror neurons that is involved in empathy. Uh, before, in the blue one, is the control, the green being uh, the compassion group. Before this eight week of training, there seems to be no significant difference. But after six weeks, the green one that is much higher, means that uh, they are much, uh, their act activation in the brain is much higher. That means that could be that the training helps them get better. But also, you can see if you can get better in empathy by uh, reading their emotional states through their eyes, expressions. As we know that uh, emotions are expressed mostly through physical expressions, like the facial expressions and so forth. So here again, before the training in the two groups, there is no difference, much dif uh, significant. But after the training, compassion, uh, group seem to uh, really uh, get better. Another part of the study, in the, if the social instinct, the social connectedness, if that is so crucial for us social, as social animals, and to have this more empathy and endearment so that we can treat others better and be less focused on ourselves, to see this uh, through a task called the social circle task, and again, this seems to be a very uh, well-established uh, study where you can uh, predict that if you have more uh, people in your uh, circle of friends, uh, particularly in the inside, more dense the inside circle, the greater mental health and physical health and so forth that you can predict. So therefore, what uh, in this study that uh, was done is that, uh, to it, and it was done with the seven, eight year children at Paideia School, uh, and it's taught by our two lead instructors uh, based on the, the protocol uh, uh, for compassion drawn from Lojong training. And there it's, it's clear that the, the compassion group, uh, in comparison to mindfulness only group, uh, add much more to their uh, so circle of f friends uh, from the wider uh, 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 circle of uh, community. But also, what is interesting is that they also increase more friends from their own classmates, peer uh, 
friends. And that, uh, in some ways, it seems to be a very, very important part um, because uh, these students, like seven and eight years old, when they are taught, first they have, they put uh, certain friends um, from their classmates, but from their uh, the family, uh, their relatives, and so forth and so on. But only in the compassion training, it seems like that they are they add more, but also more dense. I was told. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the scientific researchers analyzing the data, like the Aaron uh, Rob, uh, Robbins, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the compassion group, is much denser. And the denser the, the inner circle, the better health. Uh, and therefore, that... Uh, uh, that um, so, um, in, uh, in uh, remaining one minute, uh, <laughs> what I like to uh, do is that to say is um, can compassion training you know that if if it uh, if you can see some measures that predict uh, the better social connectedness, which in turn lead to the the, the greater empathy and endearment uh, and the compassion. Uh, and therefore, it should lead to greater happiness and well-being that we all seek. Um, and uh, uh, how does compassion training do that? Uh, and uh, a number of years ago, when I was teaching uh, meditation in one of the undergrad classes at Emory, uh, a student shared with me this uh, image. And then there it says that uh, the earlier version, as you see, it says that I want happiness. You know, everyone says that I want happiness. I want happiness. And there's a strong desire I want, and there's a strong I. And, uh, uh, and then next, this uh, very wise, uh, venerable monk uh, takes that uh, piece down and then uh, removes, the first remove the I, the ego, the strong ego, Your Holiness mentioned that, the very strong ego, and then the desire, the strong desire. And then he says that, then you are left with happiness. <laughs> and so therefore, it seems very clear that uh, the strong ego is what needs to be overcome with the building greater social circles and which compassion training seems to predict and the, uh, you know, that uh, which can lead to the uh, ethical life and the personal and social well-being. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kishiba. Uh, and then I would like to invite Brooke Dodson Lavelle to speak next. Brooke joined the staff of Mind and Life Institute as our lead person in the Secular Ethics Initiative, uh, an initiative we call Ethics, Education, and Human Development. She has been a graduate student here and worked closely with you, Kishiba. So please, Brooke. Your Holiness, it's an honor to be here with you. And I'm very excited to share with you an update on our ethics, education, and human development initiative that many of us at Mind and Life and others across the country have been working on. As Arthur and Geshe Lobsang mentioned, before I joined Mind and Life, I trained here at Emory University and spent time teaching compassion training programs with our dear friend Brendan in local schools here in Atlanta and also in the foster care system. And that was an incredibly profound experience for me. And I still, to this day, think of those children very often. And I remember specifically one time in which I was working with a small group of children in foster care in a small class. And I asked them what they were most afraid of in life. And every child in that class said they were most afraid of not ever really being loved or cared for. Every single child. And as you can imagine, many of these children have suffered trauma or experienced neglect and loss. How old are these children? About 15, these girls were. Yeah. And the chances are So they were not thinking about potential partners they might find in life and so on? thinking that they wouldn't, actually. Yeah. yeah. 
And you can imagine that these children experience trauma, but I think these feelings are not unique necessarily to kids in care. Um, a number of our students, just children in general, experience a lot of suffering. They worry about not meeting expectations, not being good enough, not leave, living up to the academic standards that we set for them. They worry about... Yeah. They worry about their home life. Mm. They worry about being excluded at school. They worry about bullying and so on. So many of our children carry around these same kinds of insecurities or fears of not being loved and cared for. So while our initiative is really oriented in helping children develop um, an ethical sensibility and actually ultimately lead altruistic lives, this is our big goal, it really begins on this basic premise that children really need to feel cared for and loved for before we can really do any of this work. And it's not just the children, it's also the teachers themselves too. This is a community of care we're trying to foster. And so part of our initiative also involves finding ways to help teachers themselves learn to feel cared for and acknowledged and so on. Our teachers are suffering from burnout also and stress, and it's one of the noblest professions in the world. And part of what we want to do is help find ways. <laughs> help find ways for teachers to be nourished and supported, not only in service of their teaching, but really to deepen their own capacities for kindness and compassion so that they can embody that and be of greater service to others. But we also recognize, in fact, that it takes a full community to raise a child. So we, we recognize the need for administrators, parents, families, and so on to really be involved in the community of caring for the ethical well-being of the children. And we do see compassion training actually as central to this endeavor. And I don't need to explain much because Geshe Lobsang just laid out one of the methods for training compassion that's foundational here. This is from a classroom in the Paideya school here in which some of us worked. But we've conceived of compassion. <laughs> The mm -hmm. That's the teacher there. Teacher Kelly here, yeah. who we've worked with, yeah. And we've understood uh, this cultivation of compassion as learning to receive care and love and learn to extend love, care, and compassion. And part of it involves getting in touch more and more with the own ways in which we suffer so that we can become more sensitive to the ways other people suffer. And also to learn to extend this love and care to more and more people, as we've talked about today, to increase our networks and circles of care by learning to see past, in some ways, our limiting thoughts of other people. And I mentioned this here, you know, being back in Atlanta and thinking of Martin Luther King, birthplace of Martin Luther King, who often talked about learning to love our enemies. And he talked about one of the ways in doing that is learning to see and love the good in other people. And he often talked about that as learning to see the image of God in others. And others might think about learning to see this great potential we have for kindness and compassion. Or as you talked about this morning, learning to see the shared humanity in all other beings as central to helping grow these communities of care. So although compassion is central to this program, we recognize that there are a whole host of other skills that children need in order to develop and foster these capacities for kindness and compassion. And so we have a team right now of experts working with us, many of whom are on this stage with us from the fields of contemplative practice, social and emotional learning, experts in education, and specialists on the science of human development, all working together, helping us develop a curriculum for grades pre-K all the way through 12. And what we're trying to do really is survey all of the existing methods that are happening out there. Many people are involved in this work in contemplative education, in, in social and emotional learning. So we're trying to assess what's really working and how can we all come together in a really collaborative way and build the best program. And this is not necessarily to create a new program that we give out to others, but to share and help educate other people and really inspire them to become part of this work. And so many people have come together out of a spirit of generosity and with a tremendous sense of responsibility that this is something we really need to do and we really need to share and work together on this. And as Arthur mentioned, this, we're working over the course of development. So even though we're working right now primarily on designing a curriculum from young children all the way through grade 12 with a teacher development program, because we recognize that teachers also need training and support, 
We're developing the curriculum and also planning to develop an online course in secular ethics for undergraduate students. And then we have plans are underway also for an academy for contemplative and ethical leadership for leaders in business, government, healthcare, and education. So really taking the full spectrum. And lastly, this, the vision that we have for this initiative is global. Our aim is to help foster and support communities of care around the world. And part of what we're doing now is partnering with leaders in other communities in the US and other cultural contexts and also partners in, for example, in Bhutan early on in our design process so that we can collaboratively design programs that make sense, that are sensitive to different cultural contexts and needs. Because we recognize that we can't design a curriculum in one small corner of the US. I mean, we work in nor the Northeast of the United States and then export it around the world. We're trying to find ways of taking what we feel is universal or broadly applicable and delivering it in ways that make sense in specific contexts, in the language that really speak to and enliven and inspire people in their own communities. So this is, a, this is an exciting challenge, but it's something that we're holding as we develop this. And so I welcome your feedback on this process. And I just wanted to end with one question that we're also really holding at part of this initiative. And that is that we recognize the tremendous um, importance of contemplation and practice in really deepening our capacities for kindness and compassion and so on. And at the same time, we recognize that this commitment to this kind of practice takes a lot of time, effort, involves finding sophisticated and caring teachers and so on. And so how do we hold that depth and sophistication as we try to make this broad and accessible without losing the value and depth of those traditions? Thank you. Thank you. Well, one simple um, point could be that um, the more people see the results mm -hmm. of the pilot studies of this kind of program, the greater the interest and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Then since this uh, ultimate sort of aim is global level, uh, so small, small organization or individual who are working in Kazakhstan, uh, different places. I think occasionally come together and exchange different experiences, then teach an industrial role. So, so more collaborative, coming mm -hmm. together, oh. people working from, and that way you can unite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Firstly, within the country, uh, different states, uh, then other continent. So it's a bit like the phenomenon of ripple effect. So mm -hmm. you drop a pebble, yeah. and then the effects go oh. broader and broader. So we need more closer connection and work together and often meeting. Sometimes media people uh, also you see involved, like television or this. And in modern, modern society, the media people uh, have, I think, a special role. You see, educate people, this deeper value. Otherwise, you see, you do, you are carrying a wonderful job. Very good.
Your Honest, we have about another 10 minutes in which I'd like to uh, invite other questions to be posed by panelists here. Uh, anything that Richie or Franz you would like to add or Geshe-la? Yes, Franz. Ask a question. <clears throat> well, we can talk about secular ethics and how morality is um, ingrained maybe in the human species. But I have a question about what is then the role of religion? Where does religion come in? And does His Holiness feel that the current religions are doing a good job promoting morality? Or are they not doing such a great job? And, and, and what would be the alternative? Are there alternatives? Are there no alternatives? So that's my question. I think this morning I mentioned uh, all major religious tradition. Major means uh, spirituality with certain philosophical views. As a some faith, just worship sun or fire. Uh, some. So some corner, and then some, sometimes you say, oh, there is some, <laughs> something there, some spirit there in the worship. <laughs> These uh, just, I think, friendly speaking, very, very primitive sort of faith. So major tradition means uh, more sort of developed, uh, more, more <coughs> philosophical sort of views. As I mentioned this morning, I feel, uh, I think those, those faith, worship the sun and fire days, I think not much talk about love or compassion. So the major tradition, it very much emphasis, like the Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and, and, and many Hinduism, and Buddhism, Jainism, all is a talk's importance of uh, compassion. Uh, and then, uh, in order to strengthen it, in order to bring conviction about the sort of inner value, then uses different sort of philosophical views. Like uh, non theistic religion, you see, they bring the concept of law of causality. If you do good things, to other, you get benefit. If you do harmful, harm others, others, you get negative consequences. So use different method. Uh, same purpose, be a compassionate person, don't harm other. Uh, then there's religion also, you see, we all, including our enemy, all created by God. Uh, and then God means Infinite love. So a person who sincerely, who seriously believe God, then uh, if there is a God full of anger, then the worshiper also can be more angry person. <laughs> but God, we always used to say, full of compassion, full of mercy. He said, any person who believe that must practice of compassion or these things. So therefore, the uh, theistic, theistic religion also, is, I think, emphasis uh, utilizes a different sort of philosophical, yeah, philosophical uh, views, views in order to strengthen these practice. So therefore, uh, those major religious traditions, I think similar sort of primitive religion, uh, I think more education perhaps disappear. But those major religious traditions will remain. I think the last few thousand years they worked, uh, brought, I think, uh, 
immense benefit, benefit. to the people, to humanity. Uh, and then today also, and future also. Then the book Beyond Religion. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's in that title, not my recommendation. Right? That is. Oh. Uh, the publisher. Right? Publisher. Yes. Or right. perhaps you also <laughs> involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so when I first used to saw so that book, that t- title, I felt, oh, uh, beyond religion means uh, something more important than religion. Then that, that case, wrong. What I'm saying is, any religion, there is boundary. Uh, six, I thought of that. Seven, uh, seven billion. Uh, even six billion believer uh, will not satisfy just one religion. That's fact. That's reality. So there's boundary, limit, limitation. No. The secular ethics. Firstly, all major religions, which talks practice of love, compassion. Uh, these actually. All these philosophical different views, you see, develop in order to strengthening basic human value. That is secular ethics. So all major religions based on secular ethics. Principle. Uh, we, uh, uh, by nature, you see, we uh, very much sort of appreciate affection. Affection really need not only individual, but the whole society. Therefore, all, because of the time passes, it's a different place, it's a different sort of, because of the uh, masters. Teachers, then, huh? Teachers, you see, then, you see, they uh, taught uh, certain sort of the system, which mainly helping humanity through so that the development of one sense of responsibility like that. So therefore, uh, uh, secular ethics, no limitation. Uh, not only no reach, uh, no, no boundary. No boundary. Uh, not only reach all believers, but also uh, beyond believers, non-believers also. So as I mentioned this morning, the secular, not at all some kind of negative towards religions. Uh, I think if people, those believe, I mean, generally through education, secular ethics once sort of develop <coughs> certain sort of firm conviction or interest, then the uh, individual, according to whose sort of mental disposition, is a more effective, as well, find more sort of effect, effect uh, from test religion, then uh, on the basis of firm belief about secular ethics, then different religious faith add so further sort of strengthening their base fundamental of the values. Uh, values. <coughs> so I think religious uh, role will remain. At least a few, uh, few centuries remain. After a few thousand, nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> so the important is the secular ethics, not at all contradict with religious belief. It should not be, or it need not be, contradictory mm-hmm. to the religious perspectives. Uh, we have time for one more short uh, <coughs> question, Richie or Hook. If not, well, go ahead. Uh, Your Holiness, uh, the um, w- one of the things that we know from neuroscience is that the brain is particularly sensitive in the early period of life, and uh, it's sensitive to both. Uh, health-promoting experiences as well as 
to negative life experiences. And um, one of the uh, um, uh, difficulties in our modern society today in America especially is that we have a generation of children who have suffered uh, from abuse and um, maltreatment uh, early in life and the scientific research is showing us that uh, these experiences actually change the brain uh, in ways that um, we don't know at this point in time how reversible it will be. But I wonder if um, you have any particular suggestions for uh, working with these kinds of children especially who have suffered um, from very difficult circumstances, who have not received the kind of love uh, that you've talked about that you've received from your mother, um, but who have uh, not had that kind of benefit. Uh, is there anything uh, that, that you can recommend? Uh, I think it's again that uh, I speak to bit. The Pungu Chusene, the young dad, that's a chamba. The Zutadi, Pager, Chick Tapo, Level Gion Shaw, Level Gior, Chichina, Pager Carmen. Da, John Dash and some Pager, the Pager. John Dagaton, a level in your dress, young girl, peasant did a set of horse. Yes. The Democrats and the children, they are told Madame Batiglia. So that will level it. Could you tell yourself? Taco, the biological gun, you did a day, chicks and soldier yard or car. Yes. That Namju Pesuchen, just some down, some down in your dance, and it. Let me tell you, I'm retarded in the middle of the car. Let me see, Pesu, yeah. So um, earlier, His Holiness was saying that he made the distinction between two levels of compassion, if you want. One is the more instinctual, biologically based compassion that we are all naturally capable of. And the other one is another level of compassion where we are actually using our intelligence and awareness to bring to bear on that seat to further develop and extend it. So those who do not receive affection at early first age, level. the first level, maybe because it's so dependent upon the brain, uh, you know, once that gets damaged, that part of the affection may be perhaps more difficult to restore. But that still leaves the possibility that these people or children can respond to the second level of compassion mm -hmm. where, you know, awareness can play a role. And that might still be possible. Mm -hmm. Of course, the person is the brain damage sometimes. Of course. course, this presupposes that the child or the person is capable of using, sure. you know, kind of reflection and so on. Uh, again, out of my curiosity, take a picture of the book. This is the Maori Chatuja Rungeti, Minea Bajaji of the Kache. In my own, the Magacha is all right. It is just a, a question to Richie's uh, slides that you showed of the two videos. Uh, there was one helping uh, video and the hindering video. And the helper had a yellow color and the hinderer had a blue color. So the, 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 vari the variability of the color preference has been taken into account? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Uh, uh, the, so some children uh, received it with the blue being the helper and the, uh, and the yellow being the hinderer, and the other half of children had it reversed. <laughs> then Changa 
so his holiness is just commenting on the, the cartoon <laughs> that Tukishala showed. He was wondering about the, the appearance of the monk there. It looked quite funny. On the one hand, he had a, in a rosary around its neck, so which suggests that it's not a Theravada <laughs> monk. But then because it has a sort of a um, hair on the top, in which case in the, in the Tibetan tradition, if someone had a hair, would be not wearing a red, but like a whitish robe. <laughs> ちょっとけみでこれやろうしもやろう。あれ、なるほど。これ、なんかしょぼだけ。ピネレンジョルシャ。うん。さあ、ね、これでしょ。ピネレンジョルシャ。うん。さあ、ね、これでしょ。ピ
but you've also initiated a new curriculum for us, not only for the monks, but you've also brought something new into this community, community of scholars, scientists, young students, and so forth. And for me, this was something which for decades I was looking for. And you, I think, embody in your own life, in a modest way, actually, but in a relentless way, your commitment to this union, this connection between, between us. And you spoke especially about the importance of friendship. You know, when uh, Richie said, in order to speak, you need a community. But you also need a community to speak about this. So we do it in the privacy of your home every couple of years in Dharamsala. But now we've taken it around the world. And so this dialogue, not force, but dialogue, this awareness, not force, but awareness, begins to live among all of us. You know, there's a wonderful line from Simone Weil, the French woman philosopher who died just at the end of the Second World War, where she says, nothing among human things has such power to keep our gaze fixed ever more intensely upon God than friendship. That our gaze, nothing among human things has such power to keep our gaze fixed ever more intensely upon God than friendship. So when you spoke about God and the idea and the reality of love, you could say nothing has more power to keep our gaze fixed on love than friendship. So through these decades, friendships have grown, collegiality, hard conversations, common inquiry. So I wish for this to continue for another decade or two, that we have more members join that circle of friends, that this important dialogue, that this important awareness can become widespread. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.